Thank you. Welcome. My name is Arvind Tripathi, and uh, I am an associate professor here in business school. And uh, I would like to welcome you all. And I see that we have a lot of people from faculty of science and engineering and from business school. And uh, thank you for coming to this wonderful event. Uh, before we start, uh, just a few health and safety announcements. So exits are right in the back. In case of emergency, get out of there and get to the Vineyard Street. And I'm sure the building is very well designed, so you can find bathrooms. Would not be a problem. Um, so today, uh, the talk is about product design. And we have a wonderful spe speaker, Andrew Law, from Netflix. And uh, so I know many of you probably use mobile devices uh, for streaming videos and all kinds of content. And uh, Andrew is the one who is behind all that. So in case your device or streaming is not working, you know who to call. <laughs> So I will just invite Andrew now. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. So just a little bit of uh, context setting. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation that's roughly 25, 30 minutes, and then we want to open it up for questions. So if you have those burning questions about Netflix, how we work, how we develop our product, please get them ready. And I'll be happy to answer as many of them as possible towards the end. Uh, before we get started, I want to show we are a streaming company, so I'm going to play a video from YouTube. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's one we made. Uh, hopefully the audio works and is not too loud. I can't really rant. Yeah. <laughs> So that's a uh, video that we made for a feature that we created called, called Smart Downloads, which launched uh, not too long ago. Uh, and that's the type of innovation work that my team is responsible for, specifically on mobile, as well as the website. Uh, so those are my two kind of areas of responsibility. Um, so I, I gave this talk earlier today. I've been talking for like five hours, but I'm really excited to be able to share some of this stuff with you guys and hopefully have a conversation about it. Um, I got into design about 14 years ago. Um, I started doing very, very small projects just kind of for fun. Um, so I did things like posters for friends' bands and album covers and t-shirts and, and fun things like that uh, before I ever knew that this was going to be my career. Uh, I was sitting in seats very similar to this um, back at uh, San Jose State, which is where I went to school. And I went to business school and I have a degree in business marketing and administration. Um, but I use very little of my degree. Don't worry, you guys will. Um, but a lot of kind of what got me into design was really wanting to understand why people make the decisions that they make and how I could influence those decisions through design. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, failure today, um, specifically failure at Netflix, and how that leads us to building better global products. And there's three different areas that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about a-B testing, what that is and how it works and why we employ it. Uh, research, the different types of research that we cover. And I want to talk about empathy. Empathy is extremely important because I am from the Silicon Valley. Uh, a lot of my design team is from North America, but we're building a global product for 190 countries. We're over 130 million members in 22 different languages. But we are not representative of the people that we're actually building our products for anymore. So how do we build empathy along the way so that we build the best products possible? Sound good? All right. This was supposed to be moving. So this last 20 seconds. So we'll just, we'll just wait. We do lots of shows. How many people here use Netflix? OK, that's what I like to see. Uh, how many people here pay for Netflix? <laughs> OK, so if we could just document the people that uh, need to pay, I can accept all forms of credit. Uh, 
That's great. So, so I want to talk a little bit about, about product design, and that's that's kind of my field. That's my that's where my expertise are. So, the product designer's job at Netflix is to find if there's a there there, and what I mean by that is find if there's an opportunity that's going to grow the business. And that's really my team's job. So, we don't just push pixels. We don't just create pretty things that are usable. We identify different areas of opportunity inside the existing business and potentially outside the existing business. And then we uh, build, prototype, test, and do qualitative and quantitative research to better understand if that's something that we should actually roll out to our members. Uh, smart downloads being an example of that. So let's say that, that we're all product designers at Netflix. Congratulations on your new job. Um, this is a bigger team than I've ever had before. This is great. Uh, so how do you take an idea and actually validate it? So how do you take something and understand whether it's something you should pursue or something that you should kind of let fall by the wayside? Um, I kind of use this rough, rough structure as a framework. Um, so the first thing you want to do is try to identify an opportunity. I'm going to use smart downloads because that's the video that I showed earlier. So we already had a, a download feature in, in the app. It worked. Um, but there was a, it was a highly manual process. You'd go in, you'd find something, you'd click download, you'd wait for it to download, and then you'd hopefully consume it later. Um, so we thought that there was an opportunity for this when we started looking at the data of how many people are using downloads and how they're actually using it. So we had an idea, and it was this idea of smart downloads. We didn't really know what it was going to be at the, at the time. Um, but we asked ourselves, does that align to our business object objectives? And we want more people to be able to use our product in situations where they have little or no connectivity. So we said, yeah, like that actually aligns with our business goals. Does it meet a user need? Absolutely. Through a lot of the research that we did, we discovered that people oftentimes um, are not using the North American use case, which is what we think of, where, hey, maybe I'll use downloads if I go on a flight or uh, I'm in a subway or something like that. Um, we study people that are uh, in Mumbai and in Singapore that uh, have connectivity sometimes, but it's really spotty at best. And sometimes people are spending three hours in, in a car commuting to and from work. So they absolutely, there was a user need. How large is that need? So it can be a need, it can be a valid thing, but if only a subset of your members are, are using that or would use it, is it actually meaningful for you? Probably not, probably not. So it's probably not something you actually want to pursue. And then the opportunity costs. We do not, we do not have uh, finite resources. We have a small number of people from the design side. We have a smaller engineering team. So we have to reprioritize. So is it, is it worth the opportunity cost? Because you, if you can do this, you can't do this, oftentimes. Uh, and if it aligns, then you should, you should absolutely do it and pursue it. So once you have the idea, how do you actually take that um, and, and build it. How do you take it from zero to one? The skill is not in coming up with the ideas, okay? The skill is in executing the ideas. Everybody in here has ideas. Some of you will pursue them. Some of you will throw caution to the wind and absolutely go for them. Um, and others are just gonna have good ideas that never get out the door. And everything is in execution. So we use this framework to basically and it's, it's very idealistic. It doesn't always happen exactly in this way. Um, so take it with a little bit with a grain of salt. Um, and I'll kind of caveat when, when sometimes we like spin backwards and come back to ideas. Um, but we try to start with what we know. So with the data that we had, we realized for smart downloads that there was this behavior where people would watch a few episodes, usually about three, or sorry, download about three episodes. They would then consume them, often when they were not connected to Wi-Fi, and then they would redo that same thing when they were connected to Wi-Fi again. So there's an opportunity there. Anytime you have a repetitive process, there's an opportunity for innovation to take some of the weight off of the user and for us to do that work for them. And that's what Smart Downloads is. So there was foundational research that was done. So you, you have to start out with what you need, but you also have to ask yourself, what other information do I lack? So where are the gaps in, in my, hypo my hypothesis? Where are the gaps in my thinking? And how can I fill those? Uh, and again, ask yourself if there's a there there. The next step is to ideate. Um, ideation for us looks like uh, kind of very, very broad. We, we start in a bunch of different directions because we don't know exactly where, where we want to go. And we want to explore and, and not leave any stone unturned. So we, we will kind of... Um, 
will kind of take a, a very kind of wide, I guess, brushstroke approach at the beginning of something, and then narrow that down through different qualitative research methods. Uh, the next step is to prototype and learn. Um, it's extremely important that if you're going to show something from a personalized service like Netflix, that it's as accurate as possible. So we have prototypes where we can actually sign in with your unique IDs and show you content that is familiar to you, including the last things that you've watched. Um, but it's all in kind of a, a prototype, so it's, it's all in a build that uh, no one else has access to. Um, but through that process, we'll, we'll try to get the most realistic um, understanding of how impactful that feature or idea is to you, the member. Uh, oftentimes, um, what we'll see in qualitative research, we actually have to turn into actionable uh, insights. So some of those things, we'll, when we synthesize the learnings, we'll come back and say, actually, you know what, when we, when we explore something like smart downloads, we should really be mindful of uh, uh, conserving data. So we should, we should maybe be conservative and do this as something that's only while you're connected to Wi-Fi, uh, which is exactly what we did, and that's a learning that came from that process, from that project as well. Um, at Netflix, we do A-B testing, um, and a lot of people understand A-B testing as kind of if you take a user and you drop them on website A or website B, which one performed better? Um, that is a very, a very basic approach of A-B testing. We do multivariate testing, uh, which means that we'll have 12, uh, upwards of 12 to 20 different cells to identify each individual variable. So not only will I be able to understand why website B worked best, but exactly what nuance of that design outperformed the other, and then why. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about more about A-B testing in a couple slides. Uh, and then again, once you actually have something that you've learned is meaningful for our members, um, it's something that we will productize. Um, uh, I was doing a, a talk earlier today to uh, a, a project managers and uh, product managers group. Um, and this is where there's a little bit of friction between design and PMs. Design wants to do uh, what's right for the user, and usually PMs want to do what's right for the business. Um, and so there, there are oftentimes are concessions that are made around, around when you're going to actually productize something and ship it to your members. And then if, you, if that all works, you do it again. So to, to have a culture of testing, you have to support it from every single level. Um, Reed Hastings, our CEO, started the company back in 1997, uh, shipping DVDs in the US mail. Everyone's pretty young in here. So a DVD, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so that's how the company, that's how the company started. Um, and he was really interested in understanding uh, where, where, that, where that could go. So you know, could that scale, could that go globally? Um, they, they really kind of encouraged everyone in the company to explore ways uh, that the company could continue to grow and scale. And so the, the, level of, uh, the, lever, the level of that culture is really embedded in who we are as, as Netflixers. Um, anybody can come up with an idea, and inside of our freedom and responsibility culture, you have the uh, opportunity to go explore if, you, if that's something that um, you think is actually meaningful. So, uh, I've, I've done projects, again, I have a business degree, but I've done projects that had no design, no pixels at all, um, uh, and tried to understand if that was material for us as a business. But inside of that, at Netflix there are no sacred cows, and every now and then you need to make a hamburger. Um, we didn't get to where we're at today because we thought DVDs by mail were the right way to go. Uh, we got to where we're at today because we thought it was the wrong way to go, and we challenged our own assumptions. And so we, just, we disrupted initially brick and mortar blockbuster stores where you'd go rent a DVD. Um, and then we created you know, streaming and, and made that a thing and expanded that out to North America. And then we licensed more and more content to make sure that we had things that everyone in here would like to watch. And then when that got really expensive, we started investing in our own content and creating Netflix originals. Um, and so we continue to disrupt ourselves, and the next kind of phase of what that looks like is, is hopefully disrupting storytelling. So the reason that anybody watches a 30-minute show and you really only get 22 minutes of that is because the advertisers had an eight-minute ad block. We will never have ads. I'll say that right here now. You'll never see an ad on Netflix. 
And because we don't have that, we can really support the, the stories that people want to tell in any fashion and format that they want to tell it. So if we want to tell something that's culturally sensitive, we, we can tell that because, again, we're not appealing to advertisers. We're, we're appealing to you, our members. And if you like it, then you'll tell us, you'll watch it. And if not, then we'll probably end up making less of that type of content in the future. So A-B testing. Uh, again, this is, we, t we test everything uh, that is in the product today. So everyone in here is probably in 20 or so A-B tests right now, and you just don't know it. Um, so you know, your Netflix experience is vastly different from your Netflix experience. Um, and hopefully you guys don't compare notes. Uh, but why do we do it? So it, it really helps us rule out those, those bad ideas and focus on larger, more risky product bets. Um, the earlier you can get a read on something, whether you should actually pursue it or not, the better, because we're talking about time, we're talking about money, and we're talking about resources. And we want to conserve whenever possible. We apply the scientific approach. This is why we do multivariant testing. Um, because we want to isolate each of the individual variables to understand what worked and why, or what didn't work and why. Um, because ultimately, a failure is not a failure as long as you learn something. Uh, and we test large ideas. We don't test like the color of a button. So uh, we would never have a test that is um, really kind of like nuanced into like typography or the granularity of uh, uh, you know, iconography even. Um, we'll get a lot of the sense of that just because of the fact that all my designers have been designing for so long um, that we understand what people are going to be able to gravitate to, what patterns people are going to understand and be able to adapt to and learn. Uh, and one of the really important things with A-B testing is you want to understand what success looks like before you start. So it's really easy when you run an uh, A-B test and you get a green result, or if you get a, um, a win, as we call it, um, the, to just like, not ask any other questions and just ship that out. But it's really difficult when something doesn't work if you haven't asked yourself why you might think it won't work before you go into it. Um, so make sure you understand what success is before you run the test. And failure is absolutely only the beginning. If I had a scoreboard behind me, uh, tallying my wins and my losses, I would have far more in the loss column than in the win column. Um, but all of those things, all of those failures helped me to learn and helped me to get better and produce those wins. So I, I still look at them as failures, but I, I was able to glean some kind of insight out of that, which is why um, we're able to drive the business forward. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're in 190 countries, 22 languages, with 130 million members. We are not representative of the people that we're designing for anymore. Um, so we really can't start with this as our basis anymore. Um, this worked for a while when most of the Netflix business was inside the United States. It's no longer. We're a fully international company. So we really have to be mindful of not just this uh, and not just these, which is where a lot of companies will, will tend to focus and spend their, their dollars. And this is where we focus originally as well. But you have to expand into LATAM and understand the cultural nuances and family structures. You have to understand uh, outside of that as well, the rest of the world, and um, understanding multi-generational households in India and how one piece of content to one family member will not be accepted by another. And so when we, do, when we go and do research, um, oftentimes we will um, spend time in people's homes. We'll spend entire days with people, shadowing them around, and just seeing how they use their phone, how they use their, the website, how they use the internet for entertainment, um, to try to understand and identify opportunities that, again, will grow the business. This is by far the thing that keeps me up at night the most. Um, it's a huge challenge. We have, uh, last year we spent $6 billion on content. Um, this year we're spending more. We're just about the largest studio in the world. Um, and with all of that stuff coming to the service, hopefully there's something that's great for everybody in this room. Um, but how do you deliver the right thing at the right time to the right person in the right context? That's a huge challenge and that causes me many sleepless nights. 
So like I was saying, some of the research that we do, um, we're really trying to build empathy through that research. That's why we try to get on the ground as much as possible and meet folks and talk to them what works well for them, what doesn't, why. Um, we try to find out hacky ways that people are, are using the service that we never would have thought of before. Um, we have a share button in, in the app, um, but a lot of people will take a screenshot and like SMS that to a friend. So we wanted to understand why. Why are they doing that? Why aren't they using the affordance that's right there? And how can we support that behavior if we feel like it's something that we should, um, we should model? So empathy is a muscle. Just like any other, it can be built stronger and shaped over time. Uh, I have learned a lot, a lot from my team in the last couple of years about empathy. Um, and I've seen a lot of and heard a lot of great stories that have helped me to kind of bond. Um, and that's really what it is. We, we do a lot of travel. We do a lot of research with participants. And we do a lot of uh, person on the street interviews um, to, again, glean some sort of insight into somebody else's perspective and life. Um, and that helps us to be better product designers. We're flying through this, by the way. We'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so really understanding someone's frame of reference um, can lead to meaningful innovation. This would have been kind of scoffed at even a few years ago if you just put this up on a screen. Um, but we can prove it through the, the success that we've had in the product um, by understanding and gleaning insights from someone's life and then mirroring that back in the product to, to create an experience that is meaningful. Uh, when you empathize, you tap into emotions and you bond over those shared feelings and experiences. Um, as a little kid in North America, we always do like summer, uh, kind of summer camp. Um, so we'll go out into the woods with other kids and we you know, have tents and campfires and all those things. Um, and what was great about those is the bonding experience that you'd have with those other kids. You'd have a shared experience. Uh, and you'd often come back to your siblings, you'd come back to your family, and they wouldn't be as excited as you were, and you didn't really know why. It's because you were building empathy with those kids. You were building an understanding. You, you had that shared emotional connection and emotional bond. I would like to replicate that as much as possible with as many people as I can, so that I create a diverse perspective of understanding, and then I can actually use that um, in material ways for the business. Uh, Everyone in here has biases. There's some amazing tests that you can do to, to identify your unconscious bias. Um, but you really need to understand these. If you're a designer, it, this will help you immensely. If you're not a designer, if you're just trying to be a good human, this will also help you. Um, we all have our biases. Um, I was really surprised to learn what some of mine are. I won't share them with you. Um, but the, the first thing is really awareness. So that you can do things to kind of curb them over time. Uh, and this is really important. You don't do empathy, you have empathy. Uh, it, it is something that you have to make a conscious effort about. You have to um, employ it on a daily basis. And again, being aware, being conscious of it is going to help you. Uh, and you're absolutely going to mess this up. Um, that's OK. I think that the more people you are able to meet and the more people you're able to connect with um, is going to eventually lead to you being a more well-rounded human. And again, if, you're, if your goal is to create a business or build products for people, um, this is a skill that you really should be developing now. OK, research types. This is, I have two slides left. Uh, so noise is extremely common in research. Um, and you have to know that going in, because you want to take things with a grain of salt. People are terrible at predicting their own behavior. If I asked, if I pointed to one of you and asked, what would you do you know, tonight after, after this is done, you're going to tell me something. And it, at most, at best, it's going to be aspirational. Um, because I'm asking you in a, in a room like this, you might say something like, you're going to go home and watch a documentary, when really you're going to go watch Cupcake Wars. Um, so we're, we're really bad at predicting our own behavior, and we're even worse at socializing what that is. Um, so you have to understand that when you go into a research scenario, that you, ha you have to be looking for kind of more the themes than the, than the actual words that people are saying. So I've mentioned this a little bit. Um, the, the research that we tend to employ, especially at the beginning of a project, is more ethnographic in nature. Um, this is great to get a, a foundational basis of understanding. Um, we did this uh, pretty recently in Japan. Before that, we did it in Singapore, because we were seeing patterns of behavior that were um, kind of anomalies. Like it, it just didn't make sense. The data wasn't telling us the complete story. 
Um, and so we traveled there and, and met with folks and talked to them and spent time in their homes with their families to better understand how they were using the service. Uh, the first one can be quite expensive. Um, the second one is you can do this on a shoestring budget. Um, I still do this today, um, even as a, as a designer in a corporation. Um, I think that this is a really, really meaningful and powerful way of, of connecting with people. Um, and we just call them personal on the street interviews. This is, you see someone on a phone, um, you walk up to them, you introduce yourself, you say that you're a student, that's what I always say. They still believe me, like I'm going back to school or something. Uh, I say that I'm a student and I'm doing a research project and I would just like to understand how they're using their phone for entertainment. And then you just have a conversation with that person and, and you don't have um, any objectives other than to just learn and listen to them. Uh, we often give them like a $5 Starbucks gift card or something as well. Uh, video diaries. So if you can't travel, um, you can do different types of recruiting uh, in different countries where you ask them to do a certain kind of step-by-step -step process. So we might send them phones or we might have them download um, uh, an early build of our app and then they'll use it for a few weeks so that it's not just this lab, lab scenario and that's the last one, but it's not so it's a lab, like an artificial home scenario. We want people to be able to use it in their daily lives and see if it's a behavior that becomes repetitive for them. And the last is uh, lab sessions. Um, we typically use these early on in the process and at the end of the process. Uh, and a real quick note, anybody who's taking pictures, like go for it, totally, it's totally fine. I will post this whole deck to my uh, website so that you can get everything, you can get the speaker notes and everything else, so just know that. Um, and we, we employ lab sessions at two different times. Um, early on in the process, when we're, when we're trying to get a good gut check of a direction of taking something, and then later on in the process when we want to do a usability study or a usability qual, is what we call them. So really understand, uh, we want to see that if we create a new feature, it's usable, but our, our user base is not, um, is not you know, 18 to 24 males. Our, our user base is three-year-olds to 93-year-olds. And so we have to create things that are going to work well, not only for you know, people in Palo Alto that are tech savvy, or people here that are tech savvy, but it's gotta work for, again, that multi-generational household in Mumbai that I mentioned before. So I know all of you are students and you've probably had a long day, so we'll end it there. Um, I do offer, um, if anybody has questions, if you are looking how to launch your career, if you want to get into design, I do offer mentorship. Um, it's free, it's unlimited. Um, it might take a little bit of time for me to get back to you given the time difference, but if you ever have any questions or anything like that, my email's up there, my, my Twitter's up there, um, feel free to, uh, to reach out. Uh, people poured a lot of time and attention into me um, and my career getting, getting to the place that I am today, uh, and I want to give back as much as I can. So uh, any questions that you guys have, I'm happy to field them here. If it's something you don't want to ask in front of a crowd, feel free to email me or DM me on Twitter, and I will happy, happily get back to you. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. And we'll take questions from anyone. Yep. Hi. Um, when you do do multivariate testing, uh, what kind of minimum sample size are you looking at? Uh, so that's, that's a great question. So if anybody didn't hear it, when we do multivariate testing, what's the sample size that we're looking at? Um, we typically allocate a few million members to each cell, um, which again is not, uh, it's not feasible for everybody to do that. Um, but we're at relatively small scale compared to something like an Amazon where they can turn on an A-B test and turn it off five minutes later um, and, and have you know, millions of impressions of a page or, or uh, something like that. So we want to, and it's also because of our, um, our structure that we offer like a free 30-day trial. So we need to make sure that um, someone comes to the service and then retains as a member past that first pay period to determine whether that's a, a successful um, product feature or idea or not. Uh, we want to make sure that they stay paying members. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Question uh, up there? Oh, or, oh sorry. Oh, Go ahead. Hello, I'm here. Um, so <laughs> how do you identify your biases? 
So there's a lot of tests that you can take. If uh -huh. you just go online and search unconscious bias, um, I think Harvard has a few different tests. Um, they're really easy. It, it, it's basically uh, time and reaction based. So uh, they might show you a picture and then ask you a question. And it's all about like how quickly you can answer these questions to try to uncover some of these unconscious biases that you have. But just do a Google search. You'll, you'll find there's tons of tests. So how do you find good product designers? Like how do you hire what quality you look for? That's a great question. Uh, so my job is basically building the best team that I can, um, giving them the right context, the right resources, and then getting the heck out of the way and letting them do their job. Um, so I spend a lot of time looking for diversity of thought. Uh, I know from research has, has shown that the more diverse team, the more likely you are to succeed. Um, so I try to get people with diverse perspectives. It's very hard in Trump's America to hire people from outside of the U.S. Um, but it is something that I have. I currently have a, a centralized design team where everybody kind of sits in one location. Um, I'm often kind of exploring the idea of hiring people in our India office, hiring people from Amsterdam in our Amsterdam office, and having a decentralized team to get that diversity. But a great question. Hi, I'm just curious, Hi. what do you test in um, your A-B testing or the multivariate testing? So you mentioned that you don't, of course, test um, the color of the button or whatever. But what do you test? Is it usually the type of content that they prefer to watch? No, that's a great question. Um, so for the, the feature that I showed called Smart Downloads, um, a, a, a test cell might look like um, uh, the number of episodes that we download automatically for you. So it's basically, and we, we actually tested this, we tested whether we should automatically download um, uh, like three episodes for, the, for that viewer, or uh, another test cell was we'll just, we'll download as many episodes as you've consumed, and then another test cell might be we'll download as many episodes as you started to download, so if you downloaded one, we'll delete one and swap that back in. If you downloaded three and you watch three, then we'll delete three. So it's just these like different larger ideas that we're trying to understand which of those aspects of the feature are successful. Does that answer your question? It's it's not a it's not a really easy concept. I wish that there was like a you know straight way of, of talking about it. Um, it is and, and in that test we had twelve different cells that were doing those things. So. I'm not a professional at that stuff. I have amazing uh, science and algorithm folks that, that help us to kind of go through and identify every kind of nuance that we want to test, isolate those variables across the cells, and then we might actually productize something that has a little bit of cell 8, a little bit of cell 5, and a little bit of cell 2. Cell 1 is always control, which is your current experience. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned the challenge of becoming global, a global company. Uh, one of the things, of course, with content is that some content in some countries will be offensive or not wanted, and in other countries be fine. So how do you manage that challenge? Like, do you prevent some countries from watching certain things, or what do you do there? Uh, so the only way that we prevent people from watching things are, would be because of a licensing deal. Um, so the, the catalog is not the same in every region around the world, usually because of that. A Netflix original should be available just about anywhere in the world, except for some of our first few originals that were hard for us to license. Um, but no, we don't, we don't gate or filter or censor or anything like that. We want to provide as much information in the UI to allow that individual to make a good decision for themselves. So we don't want to bait and switch and tell you that it's, hey, this isn't graphic when it really is. Um, we want to provide as much of that information up, up front. And we actually work with government agencies to um, kind of standardize rating systems so that we can actually tell different governments, hey, this is, this is how you should be thinking about this type of content. Uh, and then they'll, they'll kind of use that in country to figure out if that's actually right. And then we'll build trust with them over time so that we're, we're trying to pick up those cultural sensitivities as well. It's not a perfect system. It's getting better. Yeah. Hi. Um, in Hi. your experience with product design, what technical skills and soft skills do you think are important for like, this sort of role? For my role, no yeah. skills at all. For your role and like the role in your team. So uh, hard, sil hard skills and soft skills. So the hard skills look like the software programs that you use. So Photoshop, Illustrator, Sketch, uh, some sort of prototyping tool like Framer, which uses CoffeeScript, or uh, Envision, which if you go on Envision's website, you'll see me all over it. Uh, 
any, any of those, those are the hard skills that you need. The soft skills that I find that are really, really valuable are sales skills, marketing skills, because it's not the best design that gets built, it's the one that was socialized the best and sold the best. And I don't mean sold to like other people in a, in a you know, used car sales way. Um, I mean your positioning, right? You're trying to position why this is impactful, why this is meaningful, and you want to create a case around that. So I find that people that are, have had some kind of sales background, even if they were a kid or something like that, and you know, sold cookies by the side of the road, um, it's, it's beneficial and it, and it plays out and it kind of pays dividends as well. Great question. Yeah. So how do you choose which countries have other offices? Because it's an international organization, so. Yeah. Uh, so we, we basically created regional offices to handle kind of content in a, in a specific region. So we have offices in uh, London and Amsterdam um, that handle a lot of Europe. Uh, we have London's, uh, we have uh, offices in Brazil that handles a lot of LATAM, uh, Mexico City. Uh, so it's, it's more regional. It's not about like, hey, this country is really important. Let's make sure we have an office there. It's just more general than that. Um, but there, a lot of it is, is content plays as well. We want to make sure that there are people that are representative of those markets that are buying content for uh, those regions as well. Back there. Um, so when you're designing your product, um, do you design uh, in sequence in terms of if you're designing f um, for the desktop and the mobile application, or do you do it simultaneously? Um, what is your process around the platform? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we are not uh, really rigid around having a unified product experience on all the platforms at the same time. And actually, because we're a very iter iterative culture, um, and because we're always doing different tests, um, oftentimes my iOS app and my Android app won't even actually be the same. Um, and that's okay, like we just, that's something that we're just, because we want to iterate, because we want to kind of do these things really quickly, that's just something that we have to kind of own. Um, so there are features where if you're on an iOS device today or if you're on an Android device today, um, you're gonna have kind of different things that we've rolled out. And what we'll do is we'll test on one platform that has the resources for it, We'll take our learnings and we'll do a holdback test on uh, the other platform to understand if it has any negative imp implications on that platform. Uh, and if not, then, then we'll have kind of unification. But again, we're always kind of doing this stair step. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Um, how much variation do you find between different user bases? Like, and can you keep everyone happy? Um, yeah. uh, what, what do you mean, hold on. Don't give the mic back yet. Uh, what do you mean by user bases? Like, for example, different age group, different regions, um, different gender, uh, different platforms? Yeah, so um, I, we, we don't have gender information. Um, that's not something that we typically, I don't think we collect that in our sign-up flow or anything like that. Um, we would only have like an email address to go off of, and I don't think we're parsing those to try to figure out if that's a male or female. Um, so I, I can talk a little bit more about like the platform stuff. Um, so there's often this question of like, well, hey, you know, iOS has a platform and they have standards and they have design patterns, and Android has a platform and they have standards and they have design patterns. Shouldn't you create two different experiences, one that satisfies these and one that satisfies these because there's different use cases and, and different user needs? Um, we've tested that many different times in many different cases and found that not to be the case, at least for Netflix. So our navigation pattern in both of our apps are the same. We do not have an action bar for Android that's at the top and a tab navigation bar for iOS that's at the bottom. Um, we have a tab navigation bar for both. Um, and so, so a lot of times people think that there are different reasons. We'll t we test those to better understand it and often find that there are, are not that, that large differences. It's, it's more so on the content side. Like people are very different with the types of stuff that they like to watch, which makes sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what do you guys have against movie trailers or am I in a test cell? Wait, what do we have against them? Yeah, what do you they, mean? They vanished from my Netflix. Where were you seeing, where were you seeing them? <laughs> when like navigating down and opening like the info. On the website? Yeah. You're in a test cell. <laughs> okay, cool. 
Go Google them. You'll find, you'll find those trailers. <laughs> sorry. I was just wondering if. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you use archetypes or personas? If so, how and do you iterate on them? Uh, we do not use them. Um, they kind of. I know designers that, that, that do enjoy them, uh, and it helps to kind of get a frame of reference to begin with. Um, but I, I think that those are often just generalizations. Um, and it's better to, to really actually like go out and meet someone and then build a kind of a case study around an actual person um, than, than those generalizations. Um, I, there's, there's lots of designers, like you can ask 10 different designers and they'll tell you 10 different reasons why they love those or hate those. Um, but my team doesn't use those or employ those anyway. I don't know who has the mic, so if you have a mic, you can ask a question. Um, you mentioned that everyone at Netflix has the opportunity to innovate, um, and obviously it's a massive company, so you've got engineering teams and analytics teams and design teams. Um, so how do you deal with the tension between a great idea that comes from a design perspective um, and the engineering side, or vice versa, where you have an innovation from an engineering side but it doesn't make design sense? How do, how do you guys decide and deal with that tension? Yeah, um, it always comes down to opportunity size, um, what, to one of my like, first or second slides. Um, if you think of it like a funnel, um, and you drew, at the top of the funnel, you drew 130, 130 million, right? That's, that's our member base. If you do something that only is going to affect a small subset of those, whether it's engineering or design driven, we're probably not going to prioritize that work over something that's going to affect a larger population of folks. Um, so it's really, it, it's a give and take. There's concessions all the time that are made. Um, but it's, it's oftentimes a conversation. It's, it's not like argumentative. I think both, as long as you come at, uh, as long as you come up with an idea that is in the best interest of the business and the user, it's probably going to get built at some point, but it'll, it's just a prioritization game. Yeah, um, I, I, you mentioned uh, testing against uh, success criteria and defining those success criteria really clearly up front. Are there any examples where you've uh, defined what you believed success was and passed a, a test or gone, gone live with a product and then um, realised you were actually testing against the wrong success criteria? And if so, what are some of the common flaws? Can I, second question, what are the common flaws and success metrics that you've seen and how they kind of get applied to testing? So when you have success metrics, you try to not make them like a snapshot in time where, hey, our business goals are so narrow that these are our success metrics and if we're able to accomplish those, we've you know, got ourselves another six months of, of business before we have to reset. So our, our two metrics that we track are streaming, which is streaming minutes, and retention, and they're highly correlated between the two. So the more someone watches, the more likely they are to be retained as a member and continue to pay for the service. So those are our su success metrics, and they have been for quite some time. Um, but we're constantly kind of challenging the assumption that those are the right things over and over, and, and developing new metrics actually right now um, that, are, that are geared towards understanding a little bit more nuance that, again, it has to be based in the, the data that we can actually gather. So. You could say that our, our best metric is you know, consumer happiness, but how we measure that is, is really difficult to get a concrete view of that relative to how many minutes somebody actually watched. So um, I think the question is just always challenge the assumptions that we're making in our, in our metrics. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Thanks. Um, I have a question. And with so many tests running at the same time, how do you make sure you're getting the right insights out of them and they're not impacting each other? And then also along those lines, how do you scale so that you can run so many tests at the same time? Yeah, so um, we basically have flags in our system that determine that, hey, you can't be in this test and this test. They're conflicting. Um, but a lot of our tests are algorithms, right? So we're running different algorithms to, to, on the personalization side to make sure we're giving you better content that's more uh, appropriate for kind of your viewing patterns. So a lot of the, like when I mentioned that everyone in here is in, in probably 20 tests, half of those, if not more, are algorithm tests. Um, and it's easier to, to get feedback on those relatively quickly because we'll apply something to you know, 10 million people for a little bit of time to better understand it before kind of rolling out whether we go with that algorithm tweak or not. Um, so we, we make sure that we aren't, um, muddying the water um, so that we can get those clean reads. 
Hi. Um, Hi. I was just wondering why the content we have in New Zealand is different to the ones in states or like other parts of the world. Yeah, so that comes down to, to licensing. Um, there, it's, it's really kind of an archaic system of uh, how you buy content and distribute it around the world. So there's like first run rights, second run rights. Um, so when you're trying to find, uh, if we want to license a, a Marvel movie or something like that in the US, it's really, really expensive to do that in that market. Um, it might be easier for us to do that in, uh, you know, in New Zealand. Uh, or it might be more difficult. So that's why the content catalog is different depending on where you go in the world. Um, you know, we're, we're creating so many hopefully great shows and movies that people love, and they'll be available everywhere Netflix is offered with no limitations. Um, and that's really the world that we're trying to get to. Hi there again. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Just two questions that I have. So the first one is, um, which other company apart from Netflix, of course, uh, do you think has really great design, UI design and UX design? That was my first question. The mm -hmm. second one is, how do you keep up with good design? Is that something that um, changes throughout years, or is, there, um, is that through testing that you keep up with good design? Yeah, so the first question uh, around um, what other companies kind of uh, I, I admire from the design perspective, um, I think that uh, Apple would probably be one of them, just because of how, how kind of clean and focused they are. Um, but another would be uh, Airbnb around how they kind of tell stories that you can kind of create these memories through this experience when you're renting a room from a stranger, right? Um, and I think the, the last one would be, would be Disney because of the power of storytelling that they've just developed and the brand that they create. Like they create worlds around their content and I think that that's something that's, that's kind of really special in how they do that. Um, and staying on top of, of good design, I mean design in some ways is just subjective. Um, so what I want to create is I want to create something that's highly usable first and foremost uh, and that's also hopefully provides people with joy at some level um, but ultimately it's a utility right um, you could think of us like a, a digital vending machine right like over down what kind of candy bar do you want what kind of show do you want the challenge is um, how do you kind of innovate on that canvas and how do you develop that to be something that's even more efficient and it allows people to make the right decision for them. So I, I, I read tons of blogs and books and different design things to kind of stay inspired. Um, and an, another one is just listening to other people talk about designs and like kind of their passion and, and things that they've tried in the past as well. Hey, um, firstly, great talk. It was really awesome. Thanks for speaking. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions on consistency and design systems. So firstly, how do you maintain consistency with such a global product in terms of user journeys if someone wants to make a change? And across your UI, do you have separate design systems for your different products, or is there one unified one? So are you ready to gasp? We don't have design systems. We don't have pattern libraries. We don't have any of that stuff. Um, you, you absolutely need that if you're going to have a, a junior team. You absolutely need that if you're going to have a really large team. All, over all of our products, we have 51 product designers. Um, if you compare that to a Facebook or Google, who have 400, 500, 600 designers, um, and a lot, of, we don't hire. I, I don't hire anybody directly out of school. I only hire people that have like five to seven, roughly, years of experience. So they've cut their teeth somewhere else, right? They've made those mistakes somewhere else, uh, so I don't have to deal with that. Um, and I don't have, I, I have like more, I'm hiring people that can make good sound judgment and that tend to be a little bit more mature um, uh, with their judgment, their logic, and their reasoning. And so I don't have to create those like hard and fast rules for them. I want them to kind of go explore the edges and the fringes and find things that they think are interesting and bring them back. Um, so we don't have those systems. It, you know, ask me in a couple years if, if the teams doubled in size, if we started to employ those, but we don't have them today. Um, and then the consistency, if you have a, a spectrum and you have consistency over here, you have innovation over here, okay? Like they're at odds with each other. And so I'm much more at being inconsistent and innovative than I am about being consistent and not innovative. Okay, last question over here. Okay, um, I'm really curious to know how 
you factor in human ethics, if, if at all, uh, into the design of your product. So if you optimise the design, then someone's going to want to keep watching it all over again, sort of thing. Is that considered? or? Do you think that's bad if someone keeps watching it? I don't know. I mean, like... So, so what, somebody who asked me a question earlier today, which was um, around, you know, don't you feel bad if somebody watches Netflix and gains three kilos? <laughs> to which I said, plenty of people watch Netflix on the treadmill. Um, so, so my job is not to make decisions for people. My job is to help them make decisions for themselves. Um, and uh, this might be a little bit of a somber note to end on, but my boss uh, grew up homeless and in a very, very rough neighborhood. And so uh, what video entertainment meant for him was safety. Uh, he couldn't go outside because it was so dangerous outside. So for him, it was all about you know, watching shows with his friends, watching movies with his friends. That's not an experience that I had at all. I had the exact opposite of that. And so I had similar questions when I started Netflix of like, don't we have ethical and moral responsibilities to get people to watch you know, better content, right? Like, why are, we t why are we jamming documentaries down people's throats? Um, but that's, that's not what our job is. Our job is to tell great stories and distribute them around the world and let people, you, our members, determine whether we create more of those stories by consuming them. Um, so I, I, I feel like I have an ethical responsibility to, to at the very least be mindful of any negative kind of outcomes. Uh, but there's a reason that I work in uh, entertainment and not medical device manufacturing. I don't want anybody's death on my head. All right. Thank you all very much. I uh, really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, thanks for coming here, and thanks for a wonderful talk. And uh, we knew Netflix is a company where that is streaming all kinds of video, but Andrew provided us a great insight that how understanding such a diverse content and uh, consumers is such a challenge actually. And so we have a small gift for Andrew. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody's trying to get me drunk. <laughs> oh, no, it's an umbrella. Oh, it's an umbrella. <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> so keep me dry. I didn't say get drunk. Awesome. Thank you guys again. And please uh, reach out on Twitter or my email if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you.